Next on Viewpoint, how should churches respond to same-sex couples attending services? Really, the gospel story is just, yeah, we've all been made this way. We're all broken in some ways. Author Pastor Daniel Fusco will join Bob next. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. How do we build a bridge in the church with the LGBTQ community? My next guest believes there is no better place for same-sex couples to be than in his church. Daniel Fusco is pastor of Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver and Portland. He's author of the book, Upwards, Inward, and Outward. And Daniel, do you or have you had same-sex couples attend Crossroads Community Church? And what was, it, what was your response to that? So uh, we do have same-sex couples attending Crossroads. We have historically. And so obviously, um, for a long time, that would not be something that anybody would have expected, especially from what would always be considered as a Bible teaching, theologically conservative church, although uh, I might not look like the most uh, conservative kind well, of a person the, with, the dreadlocks uh, waist, control, with you know. waist-length dreadlocks. <laughs> and so um, obviously, uh, as our culture continues to evolve, um, you end up having uh, people who are desirous of the things of God. I always tell mm -hmm. people that we shouldn't be surprised that anybody uh, is interested in growing in their relationship with Jesus because the Bible says that God has placed eternity in our hearts, not, not in just a few of our hearts, but all of our mm -hmm. hearts. And so no matter where someone is, whether somebody is strung out on drugs, whether somebody uh, has been in jail for, uh, for committing murder, whether somebody is sexually immoral uh, in any a way that they can be, we shouldn't be surprised that people have a longing for God when you hear about who Jesus is. We shouldn't be surprised in any way that people are saying, I I'm really fascinated and I want to know who Jesus is and I'd like to walk with Jesus. And so I think that Jesus has always been an, a tremendously attractive person for anybody just because of who he is and how he's lived and, and what he did. And so uh, for us, uh, when, as same-sex couples uh, began coming to Crossroads, this was long before a same-sex marriage was legalized here in the state of Washington and in the state of Oregon, which is our, which is our southern neighbor. Uh, we had same-sex couples coming. And in the beginning for people, it was surprising. But I always tell everybody that everybody in church has some sort of, we have a sin nature and that we have, that sin nature plays itself out in uh acts of rebellion against God, which we would call individual sins, but there's the only person in church who, who doesn't have a struggle with sin is Jesus, and all the rest of us God's doing a work on, and so we should never be shocked by this. Yeah, let's, let's go back a couple decades, though, before, before this is really pervasive in our society, and you're, a, you're a, a new pastor in church, you've got your church going, and things are going well. What was your response the first time you saw two guys walk in holding hands? Um, my response, well, as a, as a younger uh, pastor, I mean, I've been, I've been in the ministry for about 20 years. And so uh, for me, uh, anytime anybody is interested in, in being in the presence of the people of God as we worship, as we open up the scriptures and, and learn together, I just think it's an amazing thing because I didn't grow up in the church. And so mm -hmm. for me, the fact that I wanted to be there when I first started, I was like, this is amazing. And it changed my life. And so for me, I just get excited that, uh, that people are, are hungry for the things of God, because of course Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount uh, that uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied or they shall be filled. And so I just get excited about it because I know that Jesus wants to change people's lives. And what, have, you, have you taken any heat from other pastors in, in the area who say that this is a sin, we can't accept it in the church, it's different or it's, it's, a, it's a worse sin than other sins? Well, well, absolutely. I mean, you know, we get, as, as a really large church in our region, mm -hmm. we get lots of heat from, uh, from lots of different angles, and it's kind of par for the course for what we're doing. Here's the thing. Um, I personally think that the, the church, by and large, especially, I mean, the, the, I'm talking the, the Bible-believing evangelical church, mm -hmm. you know, by and large has gotten the theology right and God's heart wrong. That's how I would say it. So we know what the Bible says, and, and the Bible says what it means. It means what it says. But you look at cases in the Bible where Jesus is in trouble with the religious leaders for hanging out with the tax collectors and the sinners. We see in John's gospel that a woman caught in the act of adultery, they don't bring the man, they just bring the woman, and they want to kill her for it. And Jesus advocates for her. 
Now, he doesn't say, listen, go on back and, and go back to, to committing adultery. He says, no, no, listen, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. So Jesus protects her, but then mm-hmm. encourages her to take a step of faith, to, to, to be transformed. Now, we never know what happens to that woman again. So I think sometimes in the name of being theologically correct, which I want to be, we have a tendency to be more pharisaical than like Jesus. So I don't mind that, uh, that other pastors or leaders think that I'm crazy for not singling out this one thing that the Bible mm-hmm. calls a sin and making it worse than every other one. But I actually believe that uh, Jesus Christ came to save sinners, the Apostle Paul said, of whom I am chief. So our job is not to judge people. Our job is to say, this is what it says. This is who Jesus is. Jesus wants to change your life if you will surrender your life to him. And it doesn't matter where you come from. And so for me also, uh, Paul told the church in Corinth that uh, there were some in their midst who used to be homosexual. Yeah. So, so God transforms people's lives. I mean, that's the good news of the gospel. And so if I get in trouble for that, I can live with that. Why, why do you think it is that uh, the church, and I, I don't want to generalize the church, but why do you think it is that, that uh, it has been looked upon when somebody comes in and says, we're gay, and the congregation looks around and, and they, they, they look at that as a, as a sin that's, that's up here and maybe even adultery is down here. Why, why have we elevated that as a, as a worse sin? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think the church sees same-sex uh, attraction, uh, homosexuality, whatever the, the word that we're using mm-hmm. for it, a, as the worst of all sins, first because of cultural reasons. And I say cultural reasons because... Um, There was a time when adultery was horrendous. Uh, Now, unfortunately, it's been become so uh, normalized. Normalized. Our our media and TV, it's kind of a normal part of stories now. And so, but there was a time, and I hear those stories like back in the 50s, uh, long before I was alive, that that was just like, nobody did that. That was, divorce was, nobody did that. You know, and so these things are, uh, they became normalized, but now, uh, homosexuality now is becoming normalized in our culture. And I'm not saying that, that it's, it's correct. I'm not saying that uh, it's, it's God's will. None of that. But our culture is normalizing it. And so the church is seeing the normalization of something that the Bible calls a sin and, and we fight against it. So that's one side. And the other side, I think, is, is how the church has been co-opted by uh, politics in American sure. culture where because now it's a political discussion, we have a tendency to think about it not from a biblical perspective, but from the ground rules that American politics have erected. And I think that anytime we don't view these things through the lens of the Bible, but through a a politicized and polarized culture, we're actually gonna miss God's heart, even if we get the Bible right. As a pastor, do you believe it's it's best if you address any of this from from the pulpit? You address uh, these things directly to the, to the, the couple that comes in. Uh, how would you address this in your church? Is it something you still speak about from the pulpit? Yeah, we still speak about, we speak about all of it from the pulpit. What I've learned, and again, you know, Portland is, is statistically the most or one of the most liberal cities in America. Sure. And so um, what we've found is that people love when we shoot it straight. We tell them this is what it says. Now, we, we want to speak the truth in love, so we're not trying sure. to hurt anybody, but we want to... A reason together. We want to say this is what the Bible says and why. So we have never uh, taken, we have never been uh, covert about what we believe. These mm-hmm. things are right out there. Um, and what I found, specifically with talking to same sex couples, as they've come, they, well, maybe they'll check out some of the videos that we do online, on Facebook. They'll see we do uh, TV on, uh, on non Christian TV in, in, in lots of uh, places that we'll talk about these things and they'll come, they'll say, well, hey, so I'm, uh, I'm in a same-sex relationship and th- this church has always held the position that this is against God's will and, and this and that. Am I allowed to be here? And I'm like, listen, sure. you are allowed to be here because everybody in here has, is imperfect and at best they've been redeemed by Jesus because not everyone at Crossroads, people give their life to Jesus at Crossroads every time we gather together. We, we make that a priority of inviting people into that relationship with Jesus. but. But I always tell them, but if really what you want is for me to say, just stay just the way that you are, everything's fine, you're not going to get that. I'm like, but that's not only true if you're a same-sex couple. If you're a heterosexual and you're looking at pornography, you're going to feel uncomfortable at Crossroads. Mm-hmm. If, if you are a single person and you are uh, acting outside of the covenant of marriage uh, in sexual immorality, you're going to feel uncomfortable. If you're being greedy or prideful or selfish, you're going to feel uncomfortable because Jesus is he, does, he accepts us as we are, but he loves us too much to keep us this way. 
So we're always being challenged by Jesus to take the next step. And that's true in every sphere. Yeah, we're, we're, we're all sinners saved by grace. What happens if somebody, if somebody comes in your church and they, f- they feel called to some type of ministry, whether it's wor- the worship ministry, whatever that is, how do you sort that out? I mean, there's, there's everybody in church has come out of a, uh, we're all sinners. So how That's do you decide right. who's Sunday school teachers or who's small group leaders? What if a, 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 a same-sex couple comes to you and says, we want to lead a small group as, as a yeah. couple? How do you handle that? That's a great question. And so we don't handle it just only in regards to same-sex couples. We handle this across the board. Anybody who's taking a step into a position of leadership. Now, we do make distinctions between if somebody is uh, greeting at the church, per se, or an usher, as opposed to a small group leader or, or a Sunday school or a kids ministry teacher. There are varying levels of influence. And within the church, there are all sorts of ways that you can serve. And we always make a distinction because we realize that everyone is in process. So Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, as it relates to positions of influence, if somebody is, if, 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 if a man is a heterosexual and he's living with his girlfriend, we would never give him a position of influence at Crossroads. Because if you're living in uh, overt, willful rebellion against God in any area of your life, we do not feel like we can give you a position of influence because that's not an influence that we want to have on the people of Crossroads. So anybody in any area of willful rebellion against God will never take the step into a position of influence within Crossroads, although there's still all sorts of areas that they can serve as they're in the process. And we have these conversations. It's not a judgment. It's, Mm -hmm. hey, this is what we believe and why. This is what the scriptures teach. And we can't allow you to be in a position of influence spiritually from a a teaching perspective, from an influence on children or students, if your life is not uh, lined up. Uh, And now that doesn't mean that anybody who is in those positions don't have issues and struggles, but we want to make sure that there's no willful rebellion against God. And that's true across the life of Crossroads. And it's not just in this one area. And I think that's the thing is, I think that the best way to look at same sex uh, couples, homosexuality is not in the isolation, but in the go- in the, in the sense of the entire gospel, which is that the Bible defines sin as something that is spiritually precarious, that is against God's perfect plans. It ends up uh, undercutting uh, the plans that God has for the world, and it offends a holy God. And so we look at it in the context of sin, but never forgetting the fact that Jesus Christ came to live the perfect life that we should live, to die the death that we deserved as sinners and to conquer both sin and death through the resurrection. And so we want to keep it in the greater context of the gospel and not isolate it in the way that our culture wants to do that. Yeah, but th- this is an area where someone can say, I- I'm going to set this aside, it's not sin because this is the way God made me. How do you address that argument? Well, yeah, so that, I-, I hear that argument often and I'm like, but that's true for everybody. I mean, the, the Bible doesn't use the words original sin, but we get this idea that because of the first parents, Adam and Eve, and they're mm-hmm. eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that all of us are, are we have a sin nature. And, and everybody, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So really the gospel story is just, yeah, we've all been made this way. We're all broken in some ways. For somebody, it's in their sexual identity. Mm-hmm. For somebody, it's in their pride. For somebody, it's uh, uh, proclivities towards addiction or drugs. For other people, it's the love of money. Everybody was born a sinner. That's what the Bible actually teaches. So when someone say, I was born that way, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, that's, that's why Jesus came in the first place. We were all born broken. And God doesn't want to leave us broken because he loves us too much. So that's actually my favorite thing that people say. Because I'm like, well, that's actually what the Bible does teach. We were all born this way. But Jesus, because we were born this way, isn't an excuse to stay that way. So really what God does is he receives us and he says, okay, now we're going to start working on stuff. And I'm grateful. I've been walking with Jesus for 20 years. I'm not what I used to be. I'm also not what I'm going to be. But Lord willing, I'm moving in the right direction every single day. And if, if we are approaching somebody, say a same-sex couple, and we're asking them to, to, to split up, to become celibate, do we have any idea what we're asking them to do? I mean, this is a, this is a huge, would be a huge uh, step and departure in their whole lifestyle. Well, and what's amazing is, is when I was in San Francisco, I was, I was pastoring a, a couple churches there, and I, I was at a meeting, and there was a, a man who was, a, he was, uh, he, 
he has a uh, same-sex attraction. At that mm -hmm. time, he was going to a church with his uh, boyfriend, and the church was starting to pray through what they were supposed to do about uh, same-sex couples. And I'll never forget because the elders decided after searching the scriptures in San Francisco that uh, they could not be an affirming church, a church that embraced same-sex couples and say this honors God. And this, this guy, was him, him and his boyfriend were really uh, shocked by that decision. And they went to the pastor and said, so what are we supposed to do now? And the pastor said, okay, so um, you're supposed to separate from one another and, uh, and let's see what happens. And then he said to the pastor, so really what you're telling me is I don't get to have an intimate relationship. I don't get to, who's going to give me presents on my birthday? Who's going to uh, be with me on Christmas? When I'm sick, who's going to bring me soup? And this pastor actually invited this man to live in his house with his family, to be an uncle to his kids. And as this man was weeping, telling the story, he said, what nobody realizes is that when the church asks a same-sex couple to separate, you're actually asking them to be lonely for the rest of their life if you don't intend to invite them into your home and let them be a part of your family. It's like, this pastor changed my life by giving me access to a family without the sinfulness. And, and this guy had been uh, walking with Jesus, uh, separated from same sex, a uh, same-sex relationship for a couple decades. And he's like, I got presents at Christmas. I got to celebrate birthday parties. You know, and it was a very powerful, powerful testimony. And so I think that's the other side of it, the idea of hospitality, that if we're going to invite somebody to live what could be very lonely, do we invite them into deep fellowship? And we have some of those stories here at Crossroads as well, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So the church really needs to step up in this case. If they're going to, if they're going to require people to live this, this celibate life, if someone still has a same-sex attraction, the church really needs to step up somehow and, and fill that with the, the, the Spirit of God. Well, there's no doubt that the church is designed to be a community that embraces people and helps them along. Mm -hmm. So I think that with this issue, we believe that the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin. It's a sin against God. It's a sin against humanity in that way. Now people, f they have those uh, attractions. That's their, uh, their preferences. All those things are real. And so we, as the church, we need to love people where they are and we need to allow people to be in, in deep, true, authentic community with other people, deep relationships, maybe uh, non-sexual in that way, but, but deep relationships. And the church should be a bastion for this because it's always been that. People come from all different diverse backgrounds. They gather together in the name of Jesus and they grow and they learn how to be a, a family from diverse backgrounds. And so I'm excited to see the church not changing what the Bible says, not being soft on uh, the things that God sees as uh, offensive. But at the same time, like we do this for, for heterosexual couples who are struggling. If someone, go, if someone commits adultery, right? There's still mm -hmm. people who rally around them and comes alongside of them. If someone ends up in jail, I mean, we, we have pa people at our church who visit people in jail every single day. And it's like, why should we uh, take this one area right. of, of rebellion against God that, that there's been, uh, uh, experience there. Why should we not give them the same support that we give any other sinner who's going through a struggle? And so I, I agree that the church needs to step up and really be the church, be the people of God, be that support network to help people take positive steps in the direction of Jesus. Well, I know you're on all over the internet, Daniel. I've seen you on YouTube. Really appreciate you being with us today. But the book Upward, Inward, and Outward, Love God, Love Yourself, and Love Others, where can they pick this up, your newest book? So you can pick up the book anywhere uh, books are sold. Uh, if, if, you, if you go to Amazon, if you go to uh, Barnes & Nobles, Christian Book Distributors, Lifeway, all, all the big uh, houses have it. Of course, if you go to, uh, into a bookstore, I always love, when I see a bookstore, I always go in. I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dying breed, uh, yeah, but they books. can get that for you as well uh, anywhere if they don't have it already on their shelves. Well, Daniel, thanks again for being with us. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Success begins on Sunday, and I believe that is the foundation. That and more when Viewpoint returns. We tend to be success driven in everything from family to business. And how do we get a jump on everybody else in this world? Well, Pastor Rob Yannick is with me today and you've written a book actually, Divine Strategies for Success. 
But one of the things you say there is that success starts on Sunday, Sunday. morning. Yes. How, how, does it, how did that start on Sunday? I mean, people are so used to, I'm going to go to church, then I'm going to go to work. Well, How do the two tie together on well, a Sunday morning? What we need to realize is everything is spiritual. There's no separation between my business, my church, mm -hmm. my family. It's all one thing. It is my life. And so I want to make sure that each part of my life is being governed by proper principles. And there's nothing more powerful than hearing a sermon and hearing these words that could actually change your philosophy, change your belief, help you do what's right, help you with integrity, help you to make proper business decisions, help you make proper family decisions. You know, and that's where the church comes in. That's where success begins on Sunday. And I believe that is the foundation. Now, you're going to have people, Bob, that don't obey biblical principles, right. don't walk according to Proverbs, and they're still successful. Sure. How is that possible? Simple. The Bible says it rains on the just and the mm -hmm. unjust. Good things happen mm -hmm. to bad people. Bad things happen to good people, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. They're successful. They're not successful. We say, okay, it's, this is business. How can I bring the Bible into my business decisions? In most of our minds, has that lost its relevance? It has, because we thought to be spiritual was mm -hmm. to struggle with being poor. And the less we had of whatever was, oh, we were closer to God. And that's far from the yeah. truth. Where, where did that come from? I just think it came from religion. Um, mm -hmm. The truth of it is, if you go back into the days of Jesus, well, Jesus was a carpenter. He had his own contracting business you know Paul was a tent maker uh, some of the disciples were doctors and tax collectors and and Simon Peter was a fisherman I mean he had his own fishing business that's the kind of business I'd like to have mm -hmm. I love to fish but think about it. that's what they did you know why so that they could provide for their families and what Jesus taught them was you can do that but follow me also right. what should our benchmark be you said it should be individually. We've we're, we're got this picture of success. But what should our benchmark be for, for success in our life? I think success, and I even think the word prosperity, should be this. Having enough to do what I need to do to take care of my family and to help other people. If I can do that, I am being success right. successful. So somebody struggling with success either in their family. I mean, they might have a lot of money. Yeah. And, and their kids are going off in all different directions or their marriage is, is, is cracked someplace, uh, but they've still got a lot of money. They're, people look from the outside and say they're very successful. Right. They see these cracks in their life and they're not successful and they know that. What, what's the steps they should be taking? Bob, two years ago, I went through a very difficult season individually. We mm -hmm. went through a very difficult season as a church and it was probably the end, my, and our marriage and family, wow. it was very tough. And um, I was, my habits in the morning were getting up, getting my coffee and turning on the news. Yeah. And I really felt <clears throat> that if I want to get through this and be above what I'm dealing with, I can't fill my mind mm -hmm. with that madness and that craziness. Yeah. <laughs> so I decided to make my mornings about God. So the mm -hmm. first 20 minutes of my morning, was about my prayer, my meditation, my silence, and my devotional right. readings. And I can tell you, I have kept that for two years. I have not turned on the news. Congratulations. In two years. <laughs> yeah. Now, I That's, catch what's yeah. happening yeah, you, through my Twitter it's feed. It's easier, easy to catch what's going on in the news. Just, yes. Just, turn on your phone. But, but I, dis I decided, because I know people that that's the first thing they do, they watch news, they'll watch it for three hours, and then they're like freaked out it's all depressing. day long. Depressing. It's, it is depressing. And they're not growing, yeah. Yeah. you know? I had a man come to me one time, uh, and, his, and his life was really falling apart in a ways. And he said what he finally realized is that, uh, you know, and he was a salesman on the road, and he, whenever he could go out on the road, his Bible was right beside him on the console. He'd stop at lunch and he'd look, look at scripture. He says eventually the Bible ended up in the back seat of the car and he stopped doing that. Pretty soon he left it at home. And what he began to realize is that, is that his life was starting to crumble. Mm -hmm. uh, he was getting further and further. As, as he was getting further and further from the word, his life was starting to crumble. And he got back into that and, and it slowly began to rebuild itself again. It's, it's, it's a matter of priority. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, we always move in the direction of our priorities or our lack of priorities. 
you know, if things are drifting in our life, it's because we're not moving towards mm -hmm. our priorities. And so I think making Sunday a priority for um, people and worship and a message and connection with other believers mm -hmm. must be a priority. I think waking up in the morning, there needs to be a priority that I'm going to do this no matter, you know, if I have to go to bed earlier to get up earlier, I'm going to do this. It's going to set your day. Absolutely. Because everybody's always in a rush. All right. How do I take church, how do I take that Sunday experience, that Sunday developmental part of it, through the rest of the week? I mean, all of a sudden you, you leave church, you wake up Monday morning, and it hits you in the face. Oh, yeah. You know, you can't just hear something one time. Mm -hmm. uh, repetition is the mother of all learning. My dad taught school for 35 years, and he would tell us to do something at home, and he would repeat himself two or three times. And we'd say, Dad, we heard right. you the first time. Yeah, he said, but you didn't move when I told you the first time. So I, I want you to hear it again mm -hmm. and again. The more we hear the messages, the sermons, mm -hmm. the more we read the books, the more we listen to the podcast, the more we watch the television broadcast like Viewpoint, the more we grow. Mm -hmm. So rather than letting the weak hit you in the face, you start out with, with, with the Word of God. You oh, start absolutely. Out with going, back to the, going back to what you heard on Sunday, going back to those principles. Well, the book is Divine Strategies for Success, Biblical Principles for Success at Life. And where can they get the book? Um, they can go on Amazon mm -hmm. or they can go uh, to robyanok.com. Mm -hmm. If you'd like more information about Jesus Christ or how to connect to a local church, go to our website or Facebook page. We have a lot more resources there that we can connect you with. Well, now, I, don't, I, don't, I don't look for a demon up under every rock. However, I am very vigilant. And I don't, I don't believe that we should be necessarily afraid of, of a demon being around every corner. However, when the enemy comes after you, you'll know it. Is there a war going on for our spirit? That's next week on Viewpoint. I'm Bob Placey. Thank you for joining us for Viewpoint today.